morning, beloved, and welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're in the back, let me invite you to come on in and take your seats as we begin our service this morning. We want to welcome you who are online as well as we just spent a glorious, not so sunny Fresno day today. I just uh, got back from Western Europe where we spent a couple of weeks in the UK, both in England and in Ireland, and it was a, notice how I said Ireland, kind of kick in there. Uh, we launched our Men in Action program in the UK there, and especially in South London, and I want you to continue to pray for that uh, ministry as we reach out to men. But I would like to this morning just read an update on the situation in Eastern Europe. I'm going to read it because I'm a little jet lagged and I don't want to miss any of this. I want to talk in terms of the devastating war and the three million refugees and the 6.5 million displaced people who are still in Ukraine. As many of you know, I have been a speaker at the Eastern European uh, Leadership Forum and the regular East, East, uh, European Forum for a number of years. So I've been in Ukraine five times and Poland a dozen times and all the surrounding countries of Romania, Moldova, and even Belarus. And I wanna talk to you about what I'm hearing from my ministry friends in Eastern Europe who are keeping me updated on a daily basis, some of them on the phone, by email, and of course through personal contact. I want to begin with the good news. The believers in Eastern Europe are holding on to Romans 8, 28. Mm -hmm. They are holding on that God works all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And the church in Eastern Europe is rising up as never before. And I'm here to proclaim to you that there is a revival of unity going on in the churches of Eastern Europe that we have prayed for for decades. And it's happening. It's happening. As they're reaching out to Ukrainian refugees, and as they're getting on their faces before the Lord Jesus Christ together, regardless of all the denominational differences that are found there in Eastern Europe. I've received so many reports this last year about a major prayer movement, especially in the country of Poland, where the Polish pastors were getting together, and now they believe that God's Holy Spirit called them to gather for about a year and a half now together in prayer and in unity in preparation of three million refugees that are crossing their borders. God is on his throne, amen? amen. And there's also an outpouring of love and mountains of prayer for the Russian citizens who hate this war and are praying against Russian aggression. We need to pray for our fellow born-again Christians in Russia and in the country of Belarus who are being arrested for standing up for righteousness. I can still see their faces as I preached in their churches and I'm weeping for what they're going through. But every time I talk to them on the phone, they're rejoicing in the goodness of God in the midst of. Eastern Europe is becoming the Bible Belt of all of Europe, the Bible Belt, not expected, and is now happening. The entire world, we believe, is going to be blessed with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Satan is not going to get the victory. Amen? Amen. Well, in addition to the number of calls and emails that I've been in, I've also been in indirect contact with the head of the European Leadership Network. He's a dear friend, and here's what they're asking of us. They are calling us to continue to join them in praying. Many of you are involved in community prayer meetings. Keep it up. But we're also asking you as families to pray daily for Eastern Europe, to look at a map and, and pray for all the countries surrounding Eastern Europe as well. Secondly, they're calling us to provide financial support, but to do it carefully. There are many false fundraisers out there, so be careful. Give only to reputable organizations. Even then, be especially watchful. It is their belief that the surrounding countries are doing a pretty good job so far in providing directly for their refugees. Praise God. That's what they should be doing, amen? That's what the church does. But they could also use more help. But I believe, as I've talked to these leaders in Eastern Europe, that the greatest need is for the 6.5 million displaced people within the borders of Ukraine. Their cities have been invaded, bombed, and overrun. Their hospitals are ill-equipped. Even basics like blankets and coats and diapers and, and baby formula are hard to come by. Many of you already are giving to Christian organizations you trust. 
and I want to add to your list. We're asking you to send funds to our Campus Bible Church Disaster Relief Fund. We'll send those funds directly to organizations that we trust, like the European Leadership Forum and the Eastern European Leadership Team that we know and trust. I know these people. I trust them. I'll be sending my money to them as well. And we're going to send the monies from the church soon, and you're free to give any time. In fact, in a few months, Pastor Matt Cook in May will be traveling to Poland, and he'll be meeting with the European Leadership Forum team to discuss what further they're going to need, because this is a long-term problem, folks, and we're going to keep on with this as well. So should the Lord lead you to give, make your checks out to Campus Bible Church, put in parentheses the Disaster Relief Fund or on the memo line, or attach a note, if you will, if you're giving online, do so, and send it to the office anytime, place it in the box in the back, and call us if you have questions. But what do we need to do first and foremost? And that's to pray. Will you stand with me, please? Lord Jesus, we acknowledge that you are on your throne. And we pray that you will stifle the invading army's war efforts, put a hedge of protection around Ukraine and the surrounding countries, and really all of Europe. Protect the millions of refugees and displaced people who have left their homes. Raise up your people to use this crisis as an opportunity for the spreading of the gospel around the globe. Give us as your people the passion to keep praying, the wisdom to know how to give where it will be most effective. And in the words of 2 Corinthians 8 verse 7, help us to abound in this gracious work. Build your kingdom, we pray. In Jesus' name. And God's people agreed and said, Amen. Amen. Let's now continue with our worship. So build your kingdom here. Let the darkness see. Come on, say. Show your mighty hand. Fill our streets and land. Lord, set your church on fire. When this nation back, change the atmosphere. Come on, say. Build your kingdom here. Say, come set. Come set. 
to build your kingdom through your people. Is without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's not even possible without faith. Continue to demonstrate your faithfulness, we pray, Lord Jesus.
be thou. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping.
not just the voices. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. Thank you for joining with us. In Jesus' name, all God's people say, amen. amen. Stay in that out. Hi, church family. This is Dave. Hi, church family. This is day 14 in the Spring 40 Days for Life campaign. And I'm down here on the sidewalk in front of Planned Parenthood. We're not even halfway through yet and God's already doing some amazing things. A few days ago, a woman came down and talked to one of the sidewalk counselors here. And she said, 16 years ago, I went to a clinic to have an abortion. And I saw some pro-life people with signs standing in front. One of them struck up a conversation with me and asked, how far along are you? I answered and she said, oh, right now your baby is developing fingers and next week it'll probably have fingernails. And the lady couldn't get that out of her head because she loved to paint her nails. And she thought, my baby has fingernails. Well, she decided to keep that child. A couple of years later, she got pregnant again and was tempted to have another abortion. In fact, she got in her car, started driving down to the clinic, and she realized, I can't go to that same place with all those people holding up the signs. So she drove across town to another clinic, and sure enough, there was somebody holding up a sign. And she drove right by, and she said to herself, what am I doing? I know better. I can't do this. She kept that child as well. You know, so many times, we don't know how God is answering our prayers down here, but he's using us to rescue men, women, and unborn children one life at a time. There's so many more stories I could tell, but I have a better idea. Why don't you come down and experience this for yourself? If all of us signed up to pray for just one hour, we could fill this sidewalk full of people. If we just said, here I am, Lord, send me. Imagine what God could do. To sign up or get more information, you can use the church app or go to campusbiblechurch.com slash 40 days. Thank you so much for being part of this and praying with us. And guys, it is that easy. Um, I did my first time last year for the first to be able to just stand out there. And that just touched my heart because I didn't get a chance to really pray with anyone, but I saw a lot of cars drive by. And maybe one of those cars would have been someone that would have turned in had I not been standing there, like he said. So, praise God. So, good morning. My name's Adam Shepherd, and I would like to ask all of you guys to stand and greet one another at this time. Good morning. It is great to see the, the body of Christ, the church, coming together and uh, standing and greeting, and it's just excellent. Um, so again, welcome. Um, if this is your first time here at Campus Bible Church, I wanted to let you know we have a little gift for you in the back um, at the Info Center. Um, 
If you're a regular attender or a member, you know we have a connection card in the seat back in front of you, or you can go online to fill out the online connection card. So um, whether you're a first timer or regular attender or member, please use that card to be able to communicate to us. Um, it's something that we take near and dear um, as staff and as leaders in the church, elders, uh, being able to pray for any of your needs or give us any information or um, it's also just a way to communicate for things like today's new attenders luncheon happening at 12.15 to 1.30. You might have heard last week. If you wanted to attend that, use that card to sign up on. Otherwise, just come today. You don't even have to use the card. Just show up. We'd love to have you and feed you, have a meal. Um, and now I would like to invite Pastor Michael Hammond to come up and talk about an event coming up to support our youth. that we are, there we go, very excited about. Uh, so one thing we like to do um, is we like to go on, on different things and have a lot of fun, and especially when it comes to like retreats. Those are fun, yes, but they're also very impactful. So going like to summer camp was the thing for me that made a huge difference. It got me on the track, on the right track, and actually on the track to do what I'm doing today. I felt like that's where God spoke to me and said, this is what I want you to be doing with your life. And so it's, it's this thing that I am a huge proponent of, but they're expensive. So going on these different things, it costs money. You know, there's food costs that are going up. I don't know if you noticed that or not, but yes, it's true. Uh, so they're going up as well. It's happening. Now, with that, we want it to be that there's never a reason, a financial reason, that students can't go to these different things that we do. So we're having this fundraiser. It's a silent auction fundraiser, and it's going to be a great time, but we need you to come. So what we're doing is right outside those doors, we are selling tickets. They're starting right now. It's going to be April 29th is when we're starting it. And you can buy tickets. You can buy a whole table if you want. Oh, wait, hold on. Get another one. Here we go. Uh, you, can, you, you can not only come and participate, but also maybe if you're thinking like, you know what? I'm really good at making a certain thing. Or I have this amazing cabin that's just sitting empty that we'd love to donate for a week. And any of those things that you want to give too, let us know because we will auction those off at our silent auction. So there's so many ways to participate. And then what we're doing with this, the students that are participating, they're all doing these funds to go on these camps and things that we do. So please, we encourage you to check it out. Also, it's uh, my wife's birthday, so we'll be at the table. So I mean, what better gift than going out there and buying tickets to support our youth? It'll make her so happy because she just loves the youth so much, like I do as well. So if you have any questions or anything, we're going to be out there at that table with information about it. It's coming up on the 29th. We're really looking forward to it, and we hope to see you there. Thanks. Thank you, Michael, and look forward to being able to support. Um, there's so many opportunities to give, um, and I know because I'm seeing guys from my MIA class in here. God's called us to be good stewards with what we've been given, and whatever it is that God's laid upon your heart, there are just so many opportunities going on in the church to give of your time or your talents or the things sitting in your closet you never use that you could auction off for, for good, for the kingdom, Lord, or um, for Eastern Europe. Um, so... Let's go ahead and bow our heads for a time of prayer for our offering. Lord, we do. We love you. We love you with all that we have. And we just want to give back to you at this time during the offering um, just a portion of what you've given to us. These are, are small things, Lord, but we know you can do mighty works through them for your glory, and it's in your son's name, Jesus, we pray, amen. My soul finds rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation, a fortress strong against my foe. And I will not be shaken. The lips may bless and hearts may curse, and lies like arrows pierce me. I'll fix my heart on righteousness. I'll look to Him who hears me. Oh, praise Him.
Well, good morning once again. Uh, if I haven't actually met you yet, uh, my name is Michael. I'm the student ministry pastor here at our Maple site. And it's my privilege this morning to get to bring you the word. So if you have your Bibles, please open up to the book of First John. We're continuing in our series there, our series called Perfect Love. Now, as you're doing that, uh, I want to tell you a little story from not too long ago. It was 2011. My wife, Megan, and I actually had the opportunity to travel to Israel. And this was a great time. We got to go and see the Holy Land, see the sites that we had read about, and, and actually to witness them, to see them, gave us a different perspective on everything over there. But not only did we get to go and do that, but the reason we were doing this trip while we were still in college was because one of our professors was an archaeologist, and she was going over the summer to work on an archaeological dig at Magdala. And so we got to go to this dig as well. And so for a week, we were on this site. And our professor was trying to explain uh, the unique opportunity this was, not only to work on a dig, but the fact that it was a first century dig. In Israel, being a very historic country, obviously, and one that has changed hands several times through the years, there's a lot of sites that will have uh, something very important there, but then it'll be destroyed. And something else will be built on top, and that'll be destroyed, and something else built on top, and in different eras, and different religions, and different people groups. And so it's very hard to go and dig through those things to get back to, say, the first century. Except at Magdala, there was a site that was just a first century site. So we actually got to go there and pull away the dirt back to the time of Jesus. It was an amazing time. Now, I have to admit that it was a little less than like Indiana Jones than I thought it was going to be. There were were no bad guys, which I guess is good. Uh, Mostly it was just moving dirt. But it was still very exciting and we had a good time. Now, when we got there, uh, the team that was heading up the site... They were from the University of Mexico. And luckily, I don't speak any Spanish, but they spoke perfect English, which was great. But there was one thing that was lost in translation. During orientation, they're telling us about the tools we're going to use and how to work the site, all these different things. And then they said, okay, what is very important, you must get this. While you are digging, you have to dig slowly. Just dig meter by meter. And me and the other Americans are looking around like, what's a, what's a meter? Like... And so we kept asking, like, what, what's, what's a meter? Like, just give us a ballpark. Hey, you know, it's a meter. Like, okay, yeah. Uh, we're from one of the three countries in the world that still uses this imperial system for some reason. So a meter doesn't mean a lot to us. I'm like, is it like a foot? Is it like an inch? And they look at me like, what are you talking about? So they kept saying, just meter at a time, meter at a time. So we kept asking, what's a meter? What's a meter? And finally, our site overseer, her name is Andrea. She says, ah, ah, yes, okay. A meter is 100 centimeters. <laughs> All right, well, still... Not super helpful. So throughout the rest of the week, we had this running joke that she'd walk by and say, one meter, and we'd say, what's a meter? She'd say, one meter, what's a meter? Because we never really figured it out. But there's a lot of words like that 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 maybe we hear. I mean, I I knew the word meter existed. I'd probably used it before in a sentence. I just didn't really know what it meant. And there's words like that that maybe we could throw around, and if someone said, what does that word mean to define it, to actually tell me what it means, maybe we couldn't do it. Maybe you know more than me about the metric system. That's probably not a surprise. But there's lots of words like that. For example, today I I mentioned it's my bride's birthday. And before I knew Megan, I always thought birthday meant day. Birthday. When I met Megan, she told me March is my birthday month. And so I I learned that to Megan, birthday meant 30 days. And actually, great, she deserves it. No problem there. But again, a word I had used my whole life, apparently been using it the wrong way. I think the same thing can happen with words that we use in our faith. I mean, even as Christians, we kind of have a a language that's there that maybe isn't common to everyone. Maybe some words that we say that's like, well, what does that actually mean? Now, again, I don't know about you, but but for myself growing up, one of those words was one we're going to look at quite a bit today. It was the word abide. From the youngest time, I remember hearing this word abide, 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 and I was thinking like, okay, what does it mean? Well, it means like to remain or to stay. Okay, what does that mean? If we dig into that word a little bit more, we actually see that what it can actually talk about also is is a dwelling place, living, lodging. Essentially, it's a place that you want to stay, a place that you go to and you don't want to leave. So when we talk about abiding, it's not like this is something you have to do, but something you would want to do, something you get to do. We're going to see this word six times today, just in these few verses in 1 John. This word abide, a home, what does that mean? When I was thinking even of the word home, that's another one of those words. If you said, Michael, where's your home? I could answer that a lot of different ways. 
I could give you my current address, my home. I could tell you uh, the town I grew up in, my, my hometown. Or I could tell you the city I was born in. Those are three different places that could all be classified as home. When we talk about this spiritual sense of abiding, we're talking about a a true home that we have. And really what we're going to see in the text is that in Jesus, we find a true home. A place we want to abide, a place we want to stay. A true home. So if you open up to 1 John, go to chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 24. 1 John 2, 24 says, Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. So there it is, that word abide. Again, it's saying what you heard from the beginning. So that first initial gospel message, that saving message, that message that you heard, stay there, remain there. When we place our trust in Jesus Christ, when we hear that gospel message, we are saved. But we're also told we need to continue to remain there, continue to believe in that, continue to trust in that. It's not something we trusted in, we continue to trust. As a child, I remember fully trusting that my uncle could pull money out of my ear. Now I'm not so sure. I don't know. I'm still, jury's out. I still ask him to do it because it's free money, but, you know, I'm not sure I trust that he can do that anymore. This is something that we continue to trust in. The gospel message is something we didn't just previously trust, but we keep on. John says, keep that message inside you. Now, the problem with today's culture, though, is we very much live in a throwaway culture. Get rid of things. If it's old, that means it's not good. Now, we have to admit, too, things are are cheaper today. So they're cheaper to purchase. Monetarily, they're cheaper, but let's be honest, they're also cheaper made. These family heirlooms that used to last for generations, this is a thing that's decreasing. I was reading an article recently about this, and they said that more and more, previous generations are surprised that that younger generations don't want these heirlooms. So now there's been this big issue of, well, what do you do with them? I mean, these are perfectly fine objects that have history, that are beautiful, that are well-made. But then someone could say, yeah, but it's just as go with our decor style. Ikea has something that matches perfectly with what we're going for. And... I can put it together with one Allen wrench. It's perfect. What could go wrong with that? In fact, one of the experts on this said, this is an Ikea and Target generation. They live minimally. Don't have the emotional connection to things that earlier generation did. It's a different world. The idea now has become, if something's old, well, then it should be replaced by something new. So a lot of ways the idea has come that, well, just new is better. But the fact of the matter is this isn't actually a new idea. Remember that the first John, he's talking about part of the issue back then was false teachers. Those who were coming along and saying, okay, I know you heard the gospel message, but that's old now. We have something new. We have something better. We have something secret. We have knowledge that you don't have. The truth of the matter is the gospel is the truth. We want to remain in that. We want to remain in Jesus. We want to find our home there. And here's the first thing. If we find our home there, we'll find a home where you belong. I mean, that's what a home should be, right? A place that you belong. That's what we can find in Jesus. Because what we have to remember as well is that Jesus actually wants us. And he wants us to abide. He wants us to stay. He didn't just save us for a moment 2,000 years ago and be like, all right, uh, that's all I really want to do with you. He wants a connection. He wants a relationship, a place that we belong. I mean, I think about like a superhero like Superman. Now, Superman might save you from being hit by a car. It's his job. That's what he does. But after that, he doesn't want you to follow him. He doesn't want you to hang out with him. I mean, Superman's home is literally called the Fortress of Solitude. That's not like a welcome mat out there saying, please come on in. No, he'll save people, but then he wants to be kept at a distance. Yeah, he just wants his space. That's not how it is with Jesus. Jesus saved us to have a relationship with him to have closeness, to have that place of belonging. We are not something that Jesus wants and then we'll eventually get tired of and throw away. No, no, the very opposite. Jesus wants you to abide. Look at verse 25. And this is the promise that he made to us. Eternal life. That's what Jesus wants us for. Forever. Eternity. He saved us for that purpose to be with us for all eternity. We get to abide. We get to be with him forever. 
So another thing that we find if we place our home in him, we find a home that's safe. A home that is truly safe because of the hope that we have in Jesus. Now, we talk about this hope that we have, but again, that's not a temporary hope. It's a permanent hope that we always have set before us. It's always there. One time I was at work and I was getting some things done and and Megan called up and she says, you won't believe what happened. I said, what? What happened? She's like, our neighbor came over and just gave us an entire perfectly cooked tri-tip. I was like, wow, this is good news because we live next to our neighbor, of course, and anytime he makes these tri-tips, we can smell them. So there's a chance that we might have mentioned, whatever you have over smells amazing, and he made us one as well, which is a great deal. So I'm, I, I'm at work, and I'm thinking about this, I'm like, man, I suddenly had this hope of a great meal. Now, it wasn't like a hope in the sense of like, man, I hope my wife's not lying to me. I really hope this is going to happen. No, it was a hope in something I knew was going to take place. We don't place our hope in Jesus in the sense of like, well, I hope that what he said is true. I I hope eternal life's actually a thing. No, we know it's a thing because he only speaks the truth. So we have that hope set before us. It's a safe hope that we can have. A safe hope that we have in Jesus. Verse 26, he goes on and says, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. See, John is also trying to protect his audience and us as well, because he knows this is another reason you need to abide. You need to remain in the truth, and that truth that you first heard, you have to stay there because there are going to be some who come along and try to deceive you. There are going to be some who come along and try to pull you away. Their entire goal is to get you to not remain, so all the more you have to remain, Because if you give just a little bit, they'll pull you a little bit away. And if you give a little bit more, you'll move a little bit more away. The more that we move away from the truth, the more everything can look like the truth. But if we stay anchored to the truth of the gospel, we'll be able to discern a truth from a lie. So if we remain, if we abide in Jesus, we also find a home that's stable. Our our world today is so full of a lack of stability. So many things changing on a regular basis, the stock market flying up and down, world issues taking place, the news cycle changing not every 24 hours, but every hour. That's the reality today. So we can look around and say, well, nothing's stable except Jesus Christ. He's a rock. His truth is timeless. We can trust in him. But there are going to be some who come along and say, forget about that. Come this way instead. Forget what you once heard. Listen to this instead. So we're told, remain, abide, stay in that truth. There's this this growing trend today of some who are self-identifying as what's called an ex-evangelical. So those who are leaving the evangelical church. And there's a variety of reasons they're doing this, and a lot of different articles you can read about it. And, And some of it comes just from genuine questioning, which, hey, you know what? Ask questions, find answers. But what I'm not okay with is, is there's some even former Christian leaders who come and they say now, okay, what I used to lead people in, I no longer believe in that, and so now let me lead you somewhere else. Now follow me into doubt. Follow me into disillusionment. Follow me somewhere else. Which by definition, if they're saying what I used to lead, oh, I didn't know what I was talking about then. Now follow me. I totally know what I'm talking about now. It doesn't make any sense to me. But this is what's happening. I was talking with Pastor Will about this, this concept. I was reading an article and I brought it up as we were meeting together. I said, I just don't understand that. You know, there's times where we go through doubt and questions. I understand that, and we should seek help and talk to others, but why would you want to lead others into doubt and confusion? Why would you want to lead others away from the truth? And he said this, which I told him, I said, I'm going to quote that because that was good. He said, we're designed for community and fellowship. So even when it's destructive, we want others to join us. I told him, I said, that'll preach right there. This is what we're designed for. This is how God wired us. But then there's this time where people say, well, I don't know if I want to follow the truth anymore. And as they step away, they notice suddenly they're alone. And they say, well, hey, hey, you, you come follow me now as I no longer follow the truth. And this is what's going to happen. It's happened since this book was written. There are going to be some who come along and try to deceive. So we have to be sure to remain in what's stable, to remain in what does not change, the truth of the gospel. Look at verse 27. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. 
But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Now, if you remember last week, Pastor Will's sermon, he mentioned a little bit of that anointing, the Holy Spirit that we have. Now, some people look at this verse, and if you just take it out of context by itself, you could say, oh, so I know everything I need to know. No one should, should try to teach me. Well, what am I doing here then? I just get up and leave. It's not what it's saying. We need to always be continuing to grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. Always. What it's speaking of is that, that anointing, the Holy Spirit that's inside us that will guide us to discern what is true and what is false. But for that to take place, we have to have that relationship again. I know what my wife Megan wants, and she knows what I want because we have a relationship. If I walked up to a complete stranger on the street, I would have no idea the things that they might want. Now, God always knows us, but if we are to know him, we need to have a relationship. The closer we stay anchored to that truth, the easier it is to identify what is true. The easier it is to identify what's a lie. The more that we are anchored, that we are held fast there, the less we will drift away. That's the whole point of an anchor with a ship. It's the point of an anchor with us in our faith as well. I'll give you an example. I, I really enjoy coffee. And enjoy probably is not a strong enough word. I depend on coffee. Now, all the way through school, through college even, I didn't really drink much of it until we had our first child. And then all of a sudden I was like, okay, let's give this thing a try and see if this works. I'm, I'm ready to try anything. And since that day, since we had our first child, I have drunk coffee quite a bit. Now, the thing about coffee, I, I always just made it, since I started drinking it, I always made it a, a very quick and simple way. I'm not going to say how. I don't want to denigrate anyone's way of making coffee. I, too, once walked in darkness of not knowing how to make good coffee. Because I didn't know better. I just, well, this is quick. It's easy. It's simple. What's the big deal? But then I was thinking more about different things, and, and I thought about this, this idea of, is faster always really better? For example, I was thinking about this when I was microwaving something, and I thought, has anyone ever said, oh, this tastes so much better out of a microwave? Well, no. That's not the purpose of a microwave. It's fast. It's convenient. So I was thinking about that with coffee as well, because there's a friend of mine who, who takes a lot of care and time in his coffee, and I always made fun of him because it was easy to do. But then I started thinking, ah, maybe he's onto something. Let, let me just try. So I tried an experiment. I decided I was going to switch to a slower way of making coffee. And when I say slower, I mean quite a bit slower. Like it involved waking up earlier just to do this process. Because you've got to measure the beans, and you've got to measure the water, and you've got to wait for it all to happen. You've got to very slowly pour it and do all this stuff. And, and sure enough, after doing this, I did not notice a single difference at all. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, what's the point? But I said, I'm going to stick with it for a month. I'm going to try and just see. Month goes by, whatever. So finally, I go back to my faster, easier way. And when I did that, that coffee tasted horrible. It was an interesting thing. By daily spending time around better coffee, I now recognized worse coffee. At first, I didn't, but over time, suddenly I did. See, I thought that what I needed was fast coffee. But really, good coffee is better even though it might be a little bit more time-consuming. And so here's the next point I'm trying to make. In Jesus, when we talk about our home, we find a home where you have what you really need. And this is where it gets hard, I admit, because there's so many things I, I'm sure that I need. There's so many things that I, I want really strongly. And I'll often tell God what those things are. And oftentimes it seems like he doesn't agree with me. And I don't understand why always. But I trust that he knows what I really need. And that's the kind of home I can have in him. And I, I understand, too, even as I'm using this phrase home, that sometimes we can use words that maybe we don't know what they mean, or sometimes we can use words that have some loaded connectivity to them. I don't know with your home if you had a good home life growing up. I don't know if you have a good home life now. What I'm talking about with a, with a home in Jesus Christ is a home as it should be. Because too often what we can do is we can have a, a negative experience of something and then define that thing by that negative experience. For example, the, the term God as a father is a very loaded concept for a lot of people because there's absent fathers, there's abusive fathers, there's neglectful fathers. Even the best father in the world is a fallen human and is not perfect. So we can take those things and we can put those things on to God to define who he is as a father. George MacDonald puts it this way. He says, you must interpret the word by all that you have missed in life. If that word father 
has negative connotations, understands the things that are there that are missing, those are found in God. If the word home is stained in some way, then define our home in Jesus by what your earthly home lacked. Because there is no lack in him in that way. Jesus provides what we actually need. So then we also hear, oh, without lack, perfect, that sounds great, I get everything I want. No. Our home in him is one where we get what we truly need. The gospel message really, truly, is all that we need for salvation. And and that's the highest need that it meets. It meets the thing that we truly need, most of all, the highest importance. So yes, there's lots of other things I go to God with. I bring my requests, other things I want, other things I'm even sure that I need. But at the end of the day, I know that in the gospel, I have the thing that I need most. I have eternal security. I have that hope. And we can only find that in him. And we know also that apart from Jesus, we can't do anything. John 15, 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I remember hearing this verse preached when I was a child sitting in church and hearing the pastors talk about that verse. And I remember thinking, he must have read that wrong. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. I was thinking of all the unbelievers that I could see that, that do lots of things. They, they wake up, they go through their day, they drive, they eat, they do lots of things. Jesus is speaking of nothing of eternal value. Nothing that's truly going to last can we do without him. So there are false teachers who look like they're doing certain things, maybe gain even movements, but all that they're doing is just a house of cards at some point is going to fall apart. There is no eternal value there because I can only be found in Jesus. Now, oftentimes, when it comes to these false teachings, we, we hear these ideas, okay, well, what do we do? How do we fight back? With all that's going on today, where do we take our stand? How do we fight? Notice what we're told. Abide. Remain. Just stop and trust. And sometimes that's far more difficult than doing something. One thing I've been trying to work on lately is my own life, the concept of Sabbath. And now, right away, I was talking to a friend about this. He kind of looked at me like I was crazy. I'm like, no, I'm not talking about like the, the legalism version that we see from the Pharisees that Jesus spoke very strongly against. Jesus himself said, you know what? Man was not made for the Sabbath. It became this, this extra yoke. It became this burden that they kept adding thing after thing. And you can only walk this many steps and you can't do this and you can't do that. It became a burden. But notice that Jesus did say that that Sabbath was made for men. It it, it was a gift that was given. The gift of of rest. Sabbath comes from the the Hebrew word Shabbat, to to stop. To just stop. To cease. One author I read on the subject said, to cease from even the thought of work. Wow. That's hard. That's hard to do. But just a time of, of resting, of, of ceasing. And not, not just the same thing as like a day off, like, oh, I run errands, I do this, I do that. No, but an actual day to, to stop and worship and delight in God. So it's been hit and miss for me, I'll be honest. I've been trying this out, trying to do it, and some days it goes great, sometimes not so much. But, but what I've seen is that, that when I'm able to do that well, when I'm able to actually pause and, and cease and rest and delight and worship in God, on that one day, it affects how I do, live my other six days. And even just in the small time I've been experimenting with this, I've seen that take place. But also I've noticed that more than ever in our culture today, this concept of of stopping is contrary. We live very much in a culture that defines you by what you do. Notice if you ever meet someone and you say, hi, I'm I'm Michael, and they introduce their name, and then they say, what do you do? That's like the first thing we go to because, well, that's who you are, right? So if I, for one day, am not doing, then what am I? And we also live in a world that is just speeding up exponentially. I was listening to a, another author talk about this, and they said, think about it. If you go back just a little over 100 years ago, the fastest anyone ever went was on a horse. That was the fastest. And then train, cars, planes, jets. Now you can communicate at just a text message around the world. Things have sped up. So we look at that and we say, there are a million things to do. But this concept of rest, of Sabbath, says, well, there's six days to do them. And just for one day, we can stop and just trust. And in a culture that is increasingly speeding up, this is how we can resist. 
that trend. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. We don't often think of being brave and courageous as as waiting. We think about it as charging, as rushing forward. But sometimes we can abide just by stopping, by remaining, by staying. Look down to verse 28. He says, And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Here's another reason that we abide. We make our home in him because of the confidence that's there. So this word confidence in the Greek, it it speaks of like a courage or, or boldness or also connected to an openness of speech, which I think really those things are connected. I mean, openness of speech and courage, those go together. Confidence. The more confident you feel, the more you are going to feel free to speak. I mean, how many people do we have in our lives that we truly speak freely with? There's a level of comfort with that. There's a level of confidence with that. Whenever I am on the phone talking, uh, Megan does this thing that she can actually guess who I'm talking to. So I'll be on the phone for a while, then I'll hang up, and she'll be like, oh, how's your mom? I'm like, how do you do that? And she just, she's like, well, you just, I just could tell. The truth of the matter is, I, I am more myself with those who truly know me. And that's able to be seen. It's, it's clear. The same should be true of our relationship with God that we should have a level of closeness because it's been offered to us. We didn't earn that level of closeness, but it's a gift that's been given. And because we can be close to him, we can have confidence. We can speak freely. We can have this openness. Essentially what I'm saying is, again, that home that we have in Jesus, it's a home that's secure. You don't have to walk on eggshells around Jesus. You don't have to worry, ah, did I say the wrong thing? Did I say the right thing? He already knows it. We have freedom there. Now, notice also in this verse that John clearly says little children. He's talking to believers here. And he's telling them to continue to remain, to continue to abide, to make Jesus Christ their home. And he says, if you do this, you'll have confidence. But he says, if you don't, you will shrink from him in shame at his coming. So he's not talking about a salvation issue here. Yes, clearly you are saved. But if you do not remain, if you don't have this connection, if you don't have this abiding, then when he returns, you'll have shame. When you stand before Jesus, do you want to have boldness, confidence, or do you want to shrink back in shame? Your initial decision absolutely saves you, but we have to remain in him, and that is how we can have confidence at his return. Finally, look at verse 29 now. It says, If you know that he is righteous... You may sure, be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See, knowing that Jesus is righteous means that we know that we are not. That our righteousness is not found in what we do and who we are. Our righteousness is found only in him. So we trust in his righteousness to save us, not our own. Sometimes we can buy into a false gospel of, if I behave a certain way, then he will love me more, and if I don't, he'll love me less. But that's not the truth that we first believed in. The truth is we're all wretched sinners. But Christ died for us and offers us the gift of eternal life. That's the truth. We don't have any right to become children of God, and we don't do the right thing to become children of God. But rather, because we are children of God, then we should behave a certain way. We should do the right thing. Did you ever notice that children will pick up the mannerisms of their parents? Now, I never noticed this until I was a parent myself, but it's true. You can see it all the time now. So then I'll start looking around, and I'll see a, a child do something, and I'll meet the parents and be like, okay, so it gets that from you and gets this from you. Okay, that makes sense now. Even things as simple as a laugh sometimes can be duplicated in a child. The first thing I really noticed this uh, when our oldest daughter, Melina, was two years old. She was walking by, and she had her little sippy water cup in her hand, and you know, kind of still getting her bounce down, and as she was walking, she dropped her cup, and she went, ah! And Megan and I both laughed, like this little two-year-old, so frustrated that I dropped my cup. Now, we were laughing for different reasons. Megan was laughing and looked at me and said, like, where did she get that from? I was laughing because that's the same exact thing Megan does. <laughs> Megan will drop something, do something, and be like, ah, da! And Melina just picked it up. And still does it to this day. 
She wasn't like taught that. She just picked up the mannerism from being around Megan enough. We will pick up some of the mannerisms of God if we spend enough time around him. A lot of that negative behavior will fall away, and a lot of that positive behavior will come in if we just are close, if we just abide, if we just remain. Now, obviously, we know that that good deeds don't save us, but they show that we're remaining. They show that we're picking up things from our Father. They show that we are abiding. To jump ahead a little bit in 1 John, to steal from someone's section later on, 1 John 5.13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. See, we can know that we're saved. I truly believe that, that you can know you have eternal life. And so I think in in Jesus, when we find our home there, I think the last thing we can get from this text is that we, we find a home where we have peace. A home where we have peace. Again, it's what a home should be. And I know for many of us, maybe the homes weren't those things, or they aren't, but that's what it should be. And remember, too, that in the Hebrew sense, peace is not just uh, the absence of turmoil. Peace is the positive blessing as well. So the peace we have, it's not just that we don't go to hell now. No, but we also have a promised gift of eternal life. We have a peace that is in Christ. And we can know. I've been asked several times, well, how did you know that, that Megan was the one? Usually this is asked by some of the high school students who are looking at a girl thinking like, ah, oh, she might be the one. Like, how do you know? I'm like, well, talk to your parents first off. Keep me out of it as much as possible. But <laughs> when it moves further along, usually the answer that I give is, well, I just never stop knowing. I never stopped. And usually that kind of gives a perplexing look like, what are you talking about? So to be honest, there was girls I dated before Megan, and each one of those girls was like, ah, oh, I'm going to marry this girl. And then one day I was like, oh, nope, nope, I'm not. Definitely not. But that never happened with Megan. I met her and I I just believed, I'm going to marry this girl. And I still believe that and we're married. So it's good that I believe that. (laughs) I never stopped believing that. See, when it comes to abiding, well, how do I abide? just, Just never stop. Just stay. Remain. Make Jesus your home. This, this idea of home, it's more than just a thought. It, it's, it's a reality. We can have a lasting home in Jesus, a place you belong, a place that is safe and stable, where your deepest actual needs are met, where you can find security and peace. All these things can take place and are true. So the question isn't so much, well, what does abiding look like or how do I do that? It's just why wouldn't you want to? Why wouldn't you want to abide in Jesus? Because he offers a true home, unlike anything else. So how do we abide? How do we find our true home in him? We'll just remain. You, you never stop abiding. Day by day, each day, today, and then tomorrow, and the next day, each day we decide to abide. Or in the words of Jesus Christ, we decide to pick up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow him. And we do that day by day by day. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the home that we have in you. A place of security, of stability, of comfort like no other place. Again, I don't know so many of our own backstories and and histories of, of what home might have looked like or what it might look like now, but we know in you we have a true home. Help us to keep that hope before us. Not a hope that says, I hope this is true. No, a hope that we know it's true. And so we live each day of our lives with hope. What a gift that we have. What a gift that we have to have a true home that already begins now, that will last for eternity. Help us each day to choose to abide, to choose to remain, to choose to follow after you. And whenever anything else comes that may cause us to drift or get off course or pick a different path, help us to stay anchored to your truth, that saving faith of that gospel message we first heard, because that is what is true. Help us to discern the truth from a lie. Help us to see clearly what that truth is and never stray from it. Help us to abide. We pray these things in your name. Amen. that concept of abide is so significant. Everybody say abide. One of the weaknesses in evangelicalism is we really focused on uh, the bus ticket to heaven. 
So when did you get yours is our question. When did that happen in your life? As if it's an only moment in time and somehow disconnected from everything else the scripture says, which is, apart from me, you can do nothing. And what would the branch look like if it stayed in the vine? Jesus promised that they would bear much fruit. I remember years ago in my backyard feeling like a failure. Anybody ever had those like out of one out of 10, it was like a 0.5 day? I had one, I was a 0.5 day. And, and just looked up to heaven and I remember just singing this melody. It said, I give you me, Lord, I give you me. For the purpose of heaven, I give you me. Where the weakness is showing and flaws is seen. Trusting in you, Lord, so I give you me. Trusting in you, Lord, so I give you me. Oh, can you join us and say, Lord, I give you me, Lord, I give you. For the purpose of heaven, the purpose of heaven, I give you me. Even though we got a weakness, it's showing and flaws Trust in it, trust in it, you Lord, so I trust in it, Lord, trust in it, you Lord, so I give you me. Somebody say for the promise, for the promise of new life, of a new life. Pastor John said there a little second ago about the bus ticket. It's not just a bus ticket. I mean, have you ever met anyone who not only wants to go on a bus, but actually would want to make that their home? No, that's not what it's meant to be. Our faith in Jesus Christ is so much more than that because it's, it's abiding. It's living differently. It's dying differently. It's all those things because when we come to that saving faith, really our eternal life begins then. We can live that abundant life right now in him, finding our true home in him. And again, it's something that we do just day by day by day. So that as you go, just do that very thing. Abide, remain, stay in him. We have each other. He's given us as a gift. We have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He's given to us as well. We have these things that are tools to help us abide. We're not alone. And we have a true home in him. Once again, as you go, don't forget out there, we are selling tickets for that fundraiser. I forgot to mention, I was talking to Pastor Jim, and he's like, what are the tickets for? I was like, oh, for the dinner. He's like, you didn't mention the dinner. There's a dinner. 
There's a dinner that's going to take place as well, and it's going to be a great time. We encourage you to come and do that as well. But just once more, as you leave, just think about those things. Of, it's not just something we do here on Sunday morning in this room. All parts of our life, every single day, we abide in him. So please pray with me one more time. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the truth of what we just sang about, that we can give ourselves to you because you gave yourself fully for us. We can live differently. What a gift. Help us to live lives that look different, that, that are just so different from the world around us that people take notes. But not only that, but that they would want what we have, this abundant life that we can only be found in you, the true home that we have in you. We pray once more in your name. Amen. You're dismissed. Sometimes.